Excellent. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I hope you are all really, really well. Um, thank you so much for making the effort to arrive this morning so early. Um, but what a beautiful sunrise we had. If anyone was not commuting in, could see that. And hopefully you've had a chance to enjoy the coffee and the beautiful food. Although someone said to me this morning, the food's always so amazing. And now I'm worried that everyone comes because of the food rather than seeing us. But anyway, the food will be here um, afterwards and the barista is staying around till uh, half past nine. So please feel free to, to make the use of um, all of that before you, before you leave. Um, so once again, thank you so much for arriving this morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Emily Wilson. I run Future You, which is a specialist recruitment, executive search and talent advisory business. We set up seven years ago with the sole purpose, the power to connect without limitation, which means we make meaningful introductions to enable personal and business growth. So this morning, I'm really excited to be presented with Ivan Gavran and Tani McWhirter um, in regards to the presentation, Creating a Culture of Accountability. Firstly, we'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land, and pay our respects to the elders and to the, origi the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people who may be here with us today. Okay, so Ivan was the one who brought this idea to us um, in regards to all the conversations that we're having in the market at the moment seems to be around the sliding scale of accountability within businesses. So Ivan is a business coach, so he works with businesses around their strategy and how to execute it. And Tani is a founder and director of HumanX HR, which is an outsourced consulting business. So thank you. Okay, so what we're going to talk about this morning is myself just kicking off with um, the fact that we need to address there is a lack of accountability in the workforce. There seems to be an increasing and growing demand on leaders and balancing employer and employee needs. A lot of the conversations we've been having over coffee this morning seems to be the fact that over the last couple of years coming out of COVID, lots of businesses have absolutely thrived and had really successful couple of years. And when the economy's good and the market's good, we've got good people, we all do well. However, coming into 2023, there's a lot more pressures and changes with rising inflation that we're all a bit more concerned about how we're actually going to deliver what we need to deliver while so many costs are increasing. So I think this is a really key time to be talking about this, um, this topic this morning. Okay, so I'll be talking through why is accountability important and where does it actually start? Then Ivan will be talking through what does accountability look like in your culture right now and how do you understand where you're at. And Tani will talk through how to make change and what steps to make and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So this will literally be a 40 minute presentation. We'll all be wrapped up by nine o'clock but you're more than welcome to stay after that. Okay, so why is accountability important within businesses? Well, accountability is the glue and the commitment to the results of an organization. And it all starts with the leadership team from the CEO down. So there cannot be any individual accountability unless every individual within the business understands what the overarching business strategy and vision for the organization is. So the role of the CEO to actually define and set out what the plan for the year is and for each individual to know what part they have to play in actually delivering that, that, part, of the, that part of the plan. And so communicating the purpose, why are we doing this? Why is the plan as it is this year? And how it might change through the year? And then checking into the team. So CEO setting the strategy, the leadership team bringing it to life, and then each person having to opt into that. So I wish it was that simple, but that's the actual goal. Okay, so when you look at the leadership team, why is it that some leaders get the absolute best out of each and every individual? And why is it that some leaders don't? They almost shut the growth of individuals within an organization. 
So there is this term, multipliers, and I will refer to this book, which is the most amazing book by Liz Wiseman. And basically what it is, is saying that if you can develop CEOs and the leadership team to be multiplier leaders, so inspirational leaders, where they create everyone in the business around their ideas, their intelligence, their energy, to inspire them to grow and develop and step up, rather than being the old school when the market changes, micromanaging, diminishing, overarching, stepping in, rescuing, protecting, then no one's gonna be accountable. Everyone then just focus on the task at hand and what they need to deliver, rather than actually how they can step up and to deliver to the business strategy. So multipliers basically look at the inability to assess and unlock the most valuable resources are our people, and multipliers look at how they can make everyone smarter in the organization and everyone accountable. So multipliers are still hard-edged managers. They expect great thring things from their people and they drive them to achieve extraordinary results. But around multiplier leaders, people get smarter and they get more capable and they solve harder problems and they adapt quickly and they become more accountable by taking more intelligent actions. So, you know, I think some of the people thought with this presentation it would be, we just need to get more out of our people. But 50% of it is being inspired by, by, by the leadership team for people to step in and be accountable. So multiplier leaders deliver results and grow people. They are genius makers who bring out the intelligence in others. They build collective and they build communication. So the opposite of a multiplier leader is a diminisher. These leaders are absorbed in their own intelligence. They stifle others and they deplete organizations of crucial intelligence and capability. So no one would look to be accountable if they're working underneath a diminisher. So ask yourself, if you're a leader, do you have these five traits? Are you a talent magnet? And I talk in a minute briefly around attracting and optimizing the right talent for the job at hand, not just any talent, but what are the challenges of the business and can you attract the right people to come in and help you succeed? A multiplier is a liberator it sets the scene to ena enable people to speak up in their own voice and put their own ideas forward to solve their own problems rather than the leader just always saying, this is how we're gonna do it and this is the reason why. They are the challenger. They put a stretch challenge in place around their vision and what each person has to achieve. So it's not easy, but it is a challenge. They create debate. So rather than making their own decisions as a leader or with just a select group of people, they open it up to the business to say, this is what we're trying to achieve. This is the challenges we're facing. How do you think that we can think differently? And they get the ideas and energy from the people. Then they invest in those people in terms of developing them and helping them grow, which then should inspire them to actually want to be accountable for delivering those results. We're having conversation out here about KPIs and objectives in place, but it's got to be the inspiration that really turns on the fact that people want to do the best job they can. However, there is such a thing as the accidental diminisher. I mean, when I was reading this book, I could tell a lot of my things fall into this, which is where diminishers are easy to spot. They're the true micromanagers. But an accidental diminisher is someone who actually, with the best intentions, wants to jump in to sort things out, um, to either rescue a situation or to protect their team from a situation. But under that, people don't grow, don't develop, and don't solve their own problems. So it's actually not gonna help in the long term, might help in the short term. So the results, so a multiplier leader gets twice the capability and accountability out of people that diminishing micromanaging leaders do. So something to think about there. <coughs> So the traits of a multiplier leader, they have a hard edge, they don't play small, and they have a great sense of humor. Multipliers have a way of daring you that can be irresistible. They can use humor as a way to create comfort and spark natural elegance and intelligence in others. People still come to work and want to work together to have fun. You know, no problem should be so big that there couldn't be a sense of humor to get people engaged. Okay, so then the part that each individual has to play. So as a recruitment firm, we always coach our hiring managers to hire on skills. 
So yes, for each and every role, and certainly if it's a critical hire, they've got to have the right capability and qualifications to succeed in the role. But the part that actually unlocks the potential of people is having the right skills. So attracting and understanding whether the people that you're employing have got the skills that sit around making them accountable. So those skills are, they're driven by professional growth. They're versatile, they're really good listeners, they are able to make decisions, they're results orientated. So, you know, we always say that interviewing is not easy, but having all the right questions at hand, drawing from previous examples to see whether the people and the staff that you actually have employed have got the skills and traits that's going to enable them to be accountable um, so they can step in and do that part for you. So, once you've got the right team with the right skills and you've got the leadership team that are being inspiring and coaching and setting out the plan, once you've got the vision in place for the overarching business strategy and the vision in place for each and every, every individual within the business, hopefully the motivation and inspiration then all comes together as a collective, each person having a part to play in the success of the plan and getting it done. Okay, and then over to you, Ivan. Thank you, Emily. Uh, great to see such uh, numbers. This topic is uh, clearly resonating with, with people. I just wanted to do a huge shout out to Emily and the Future You team. Um, these things look smooth on the surface, but there's a lot happening in the background. So everyone that was involved in uh, scrambling and, and making this happen, um, thank you, thank you so much. So uh, you guys, the topic this morning is accountability and I think you're all examples of that because you registered, you booked your seat uh, and you showed up. So for those that registered and didn't show up, take note. <laughs> um, so we're, we're controlling the slides here. All right, for those in the room that know me um, will, will know, or most of the people in the room know me that know, most of the people in the room that know me would know that I'm writing a book and the book's titled The Business Athlete and the context of the book is learnings from the sporting world that can apply to the business world. So what learnings the business world can take from the sporting world. And as part of that process, I'm getting the awesome opportunity to interview uh, a whole bunch of um, really awesome people, uh, including high levels uh, sporting coaches and, and, and elite athletes. So Craig Bellamy's um, one, one, one of the guys that participated in the process. One of the, um, he's the head coach of the Melbourne Storm Rugby League Club, one of the most successful coaches in rugby league history. Um, and it was a real honour and privilege to, to be able to sit down and talk to Craig. He's got a saying, or well, the Melbourne Storm culture have a saying, see something, say something. And so what that means is if a player sees another player do something that's not quite right, uh, or not quite to the Storm standards, the expectation, the demand <coughs> is that that player says, uh, says something. Even if it's a young player seeing a, a, a more experienced player or a young player seeing an absolute superstar do the wrong thing at, at the pub at 2am or, or in the training paddock, that demand is something be said. And the idea of that is that the team, the expectation of the team is it holds itself accountable. It doesn't always have to come from the leader. And that's a real hallmark and a, I would say a common personality trait of uh, highly accountable teams, that the team does it as well. The team holds itself accountable, doesn't always uh, have to come from the leader. So today, my bit of the, the presentation is talking about high-performing teams through the lens of accountability, what that looks like, how that's different to other teams. But also to give you a way to understand where your culture is right now. So I'm going to give you a tool, a practical tool, um, hopefully you'll find it practical, just to help you understand and, and assess where, where your culture is at right now. So this is a really simple continuum that just shows the degrees to which a team is willing uh, to challenge itself. So on one end, there's a real willingness and appetite to challenge each other. Uh, on the other end, there's not. So there's, a, there's, no, there's no sort of appetite to have those more difficult uh, conversations. There's no hard edge, uh, as, as Emily would say. And what drives a team to avoid those difficult conversations? So in my experience, there's usually a couple of things. So firstly, the team either cares too much about each other and the relationship is put on this pedestal and it's prioritised above the business outcome. So we're going to avoid those difficult chats to protect the other person's feelings. Uh, or the other reason is there's not enough care and so there's not um, 
a, a real engagement or buy-in. There's not enough care about the business, the strategy, the vision, the values. There's not enough care about each other. So it creates a real um, apathy. So let's, let's deep dive into the really, really nice culture. Anyone had an experience of a really, really nice culture? Those pleasant ones that avoid the difficult chats? Anyone? There's a few head nods. So it can be nice. <laughs> In fact, it is really nice, but there's a cost to it. My son, 17-year-old, came home recently with a really weird-looking haircut. He had a line going here, some spiky bits here. Uh, it was all, all very strange to me. I didn't, I didn't really get it. But he came home really excited. Um, he wanted to show it off, and he wanted to see what we thought. So he's looking at me with these wide open eyes, you know, what do you think? So this is a 17 year old that hasn't really been too interested in any of my opinions on anything for the last few years. So I'm sort of sitting there in this situation going, what do I, what do, I do with this? Uh, do, do I tell him what I really think? So I copped out, I chickened out, and I told him how, how cool I thought um, he really looked. And if I had the gift of hair, I, I would have done the same thing. That's what I said. So Lukey, if you're watching this, uh, I lied, I'm sorry. <laughs> So that, that's what we mean by really, really nice. We avoid the truth in pursuit of protecting the other person's feelings. I've got a really good friend that runs a reasonable sized business across Australia, uh, and that business is not going too well. It's going backwards at a rate of knots. His assessment is that the business has gone above and beyond in terms of supporting its people, um, workplace flexibility, reward recognition, training, uh, extra resources, extra capacity, you name it. So his assessment is that the business has gone well, you know, f far above and beyond in terms of supporting its people and he doesn't feel a love coming back. That's where, that's where he's at. He's not feeling that support coming back from the team. There's all these standards that are slipping and they're not sort of finding their way back to, to where they need to. So he's made a decision to do a road show and go out and visit all the branches across the country and give some hard edge, give some hard edge and deliver some some home truth. So he sort of bounced that off me, asked for my opinion. I said, that sounds like a great idea. Good luck. Uh, so I caught up with him afterwards and I said, how'd the road show go? He said, don't ask. I said, why? He said, I told everyone what a wonderful job they're doing and I really appreciate their, their efforts. I said, yep. Yeah. And? And that was it. He chickened out. And the reason he chickened out is he, this is in his words, I could not bear the idea of another resignation letter. He just couldn't bear it. So I don't know if there's this experience is happening with people in the room, but what I'm seeing, COVID caused this huge, almost collective midlife crisis. So people just press this big reset button and just reassess everything. They reassess where they're at in their life, their life priorities, if they're in the right role, in the right, in the right industry, which is an awesome thing for people to be doing. They should be doing that all the time. It's a shame that it took a global pandemic uh, to trigger that en masse. So the consequence of that is there was a lot of people leaving their roles or winding down to part-time or whatever it was. And the, the consequence of that for businesses is in a really concentrated period of time, businesses lost a lot of capacity and a lot of capability. So you've got all these leaders now walking on eggshells afraid of the next resignation letter. And, and, and in, in, um, uh, as a consequence of that, they're avoiding these difficult chats. So that's one of the reasons that creates these really, really nice cultures. We're avoiding the tough chats because we just don't want to lose anyone. And the other reason is they're just really nice people. So the relationship is, is prioritised above the business outcome. We must protect that at all costs. So the behaviours, the telltale signs that you're in a really, really nice culture, there's a lot of positive reinforcement, there's a lot of encouragement, there's a lot of um, chemistry and connection coming from a genuine place because they're real relationships, but we avoid the truth. Uh, often if, if, if there's an opportunity for the business to have a, a, if there's an opportunity for a difficult conversation that would be better for the business, that's often uh, avoided. So um, low care, low challenge, the apathetic culture. My wife and I were watching a movie recently and in the movie there was this scene where the wife was talking to the husband uh, and, and the wife was sharing with the husband her frustrations that he was not giving enough time and energy to his family. And so she made some, you know, she, she made those feelings clear and, and tried to set some ground rules. And she said, one of the things that I reckon is, is, is a non-negotiable and, and I, I expect that I demand that I don't think it's unfair, I want you home for dinner every single day on time. I think that's the least you can do as a father and as a husband, have dinner with us every day. And the husband said, fair call, done, consider it done. So the next scene pants this guy on the phone with his mate. And he's telling his mate, I'm in trouble. I've just made a promise to my wife that there's just no chance I can, um, I can fulfil. 
And as we're watching this, my wife turns to me and says, have you ever done that to me? I said, no, of course not. <laughs> so I became that guy in the movie. So I just didn't have the energy for that conversation. I was tired, big day, big week. The whole point of watching a movie is zoning out. I was not up for that sort of conversation. So the range of behaviours in the apathetic culture ranges from those more in arguably innocent moments where you're avoiding the honest chats because you just don't have the energy to the other extreme, and the other extreme of that quadrant is undermining. And I'll explain what I mean by undermining through an example. So as part of this book project, uh, I had the awesome opportunity to talk to Rod McQueen, who's the um, ex-coach of the Wallabies, the Australian Rugby Union team. I talked to him earlier this week. And he was just sharing a story. Uh, and the story goes, there was a couple of players that were not buying into his philosophy. So he had a certain philosophy that he wanted the team to follow as far as the way they attacked and the way they, they defended and there was a couple of players that weren't buying in. And that in and of itself is not the problem, because that, that's pretty common. But the problem was that they weren't saying anything. They were just sort of sitting there nodding and politely head nodding and politely agreeing, but they didn't really buy in. And what made it worse is they went to the media and leaked all this uh, nasty stuff, lies, to undermine Rod and his staff. So luckily Rod caught that in time and he dealt with that in his own way. Um, but that's what we mean by undermining, where people are there in a boardroom or in an executive meeting or whatever, whatever it is, they're sort of politely head nodding uh, and agreeing but they don't really mean it and they go out and do all this nasty stuff to undermine the decision and undermine the team. So the drivers for an apathetic culture range from the more simple, people just don't have the energy to really engage, to um, cultural misfits and they're there for the wrong reasons, they're there for themselves, not for the team. Uh, to fear, so sometimes fear is a driver of apathy. So if I put my head up and challenge and, and try to um, uh, create a conversation about something, then I might get my head chopped off. So there's a few different reasons for this type of energy to be showing up. And the telltale signs an ap of an apathetic culture, overly compliant, polite head nodding, or at an extreme um, undermining. So if we swing to the other side of the challenge continuum, so this is when teams are much more willing to challenge and have those difficult chats. And that can either sow the seeds for a high-performing team or it can be quite dangerous if, it's expressed its, um, it, if it expresses itself uh, aggressively. Anyone had an experience of an aggressive culture? Yes, there's a few, few head nods. I worked for an investment bank <coughs> as, as in, in my former life, so it was pretty... Uh, dog eat dog. So aggressive cultures, they come from a place of, well there's a few different drivers, control, ego, or sometimes they just don't get the balance right between task and relationship. So there's a bit of research around aggressive behaviours and it turns out that sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes, as difficult as that might be to believe when you're on the receiving end, sometimes it's not intentional. It's just that, that in that moment, the task is more important than the relationship and that expresses itself in an aggressive way but it's not really intentional. So there's a few different drivers there. Control, ego, where it is intentional or it's just that in that moment the task is, is more important. Telltale signs for an aggressive culture. Uh, it can be quite personal. So you're not addressing the issue. You're, you're sort of you're pl playing the man, not the ball, as they say in the sporting analogy. That, that You're attacking the person, not the issue. Uh, it can be quite blamey. Uh, it can be quite judgmental can be quite heated. You feel an aggressive culture when you walk out of, of the elevator. It's quite heated. Uh, it's quite tense. Uh, ironically, well, sort of ironically, accountability can be a strength of these cultures. It can be a strength, but the risk is it's not sustainable. And the reason it's not sustainable is because relationships will ultimately break down if that's a bit of a, a default pattern, or people will just burn out, or people stop listening. So if accountability c uh, continues to come from an aggressive source or, an, or, or delivered with an aggressive tone, when the hard edge just goes too, too much and there's a lack of compassion, people at some point stop listening and just sort of um, washes over, just becomes uh, white noise. And then we've got the high-performing cultures. Who's in a high-performing culture? Everyone from Future You, raise your hands, or Human X. There's a few. Who's in a high-performing culture? There's a few. Cool. Awesome. So what do we mean by high-performing through the lens of accountability? I'll, I'll explain... Um, I'll explain it through, through, an through a couple of examples and then I'll sort of tie it back to this framework. So I sat on a not-for-profit board for a while um, and I thought it was a pretty um, high-performing culture. It was one of the most high-performing cultures that I'd, I'd been part of. It was really purpose-driven, 
it was volunteer, no paid, it was unpaid, it was really purpose driven, um, real commitment. And it was just one of those environments that was really infectious. He sort of just got swept, swept up in it. Uh, and there was a guy that joined, there was a director that joined and you could just tell uh, he just didn't get it at, at first. He just didn't get it. He didn't get what this was really about. It was a volunteer thing. You could just tell he wasn't truly understanding what the culture was. So first board meeting, he gets thrown a few actions and he didn't do them. And not only did he not do them, he didn't do the expectation management uh, in advance. So we get to the second board meeting and we get to the actions. And it, and it came to him. Sorry, got too busy, didn't do it. And I, was just, I remember looking at him going, you're about to get indoctrinated into this culture. And we all sort of looked at each other as if to say, who's going who's gonna to take the stage here? And the chair, w wonderful chair, and one, one of the best leaders I've sort of had uh, an experience with, she, she sort of took the stage and, and she just jumped in and said, that's not cool. That's not the way things are done around here. Um, that's not what our standards are. If you're going to you know, commit to do something, you've got to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what high-performing teams do. There's clear standards and those standards are held in those key moments because the standards you walk past are the standards you create. You can have all these words up on the wall, all these posters up on the wall, but it's how the team deals with um, those key moments when the standards aren't being met that matters more. Those key moments matter more than any poster, they matter more than any reward and recognition program, they, would, they matter more than team building activities. Not that those things don't matter, but it's the way a team deals with key moments when standards slip that matters more. If that's the one takeaway, I'd really sort of um, underline that point. Jurgen Klopp, for those that know me know he's my hero. Uh, he's the Liverpool uh, coach. Liverpool is a soccer club in, in England. And Liverpool are having a really tough time of it this season. They're not at their usual um, standards. And a journalist asked him recently, um, why are you here? Why don't you just, you know, escape? Go live your life. You've got enough money. Um, have you ever been tempted? That was the question. Have you ever been tempted just to walk away and just enjoy life? And his response was really telling for me. Had really had an impact on me. He said, I can't. I physically cannot walk away because I feel too much responsibility. I feel too much responsibility and I need to lead this, this club out of this mess that we're in or out of this situation. And that's what you hear a lot of from high-performing cultures. A role is not a set of tasks. It's not a set of processes. It's a feeling of responsibility to yourself, to your teammates and to your organisation. Um, I, I mentioned earlier this walking on eggshells that I feel and I see a lot. Leaders walking on eggshells to avoid the difficult chats. This book project that I'm on, I've, I've interviewed a whole bunch of um, uh, professional sporting coaches and elite athletes and I've s specifically made a point in every interview to lay that scenario out to them. So there's a capacity issue, there's a capability problem, businesses have lost a lot of capacity and capability, leaders are walking on eggshells, etc. I laid it all out and I specifically asked everyone that, I, that I've interviewed in the sporting world for this project what their advice was to the business world given the, the, these dynamics. And every single one of them, doesn't matter if it's hockey, AFL, I've, every sporting coach pretty much have, has been represented in this. Every, every response was exactly the same. I would rather be playing with two or three less players on the field than have some cultural misfits. Every single one said the same, in their own words, but that was the same sort of message. So leaders in, in high-performing teams, they'll always prioritise culture above capacity. They'll never burn the future for the sake of the present. So in summary, cultures through the lens of accountability, there's a few different ways it can show up. From really, really nice to apathetic, high performing and aggressive. And it's all a function of care and challenge. And to pin your culture or to find the, 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 the bit of the, this framework where your culture is, just use a really simple numbering system, one to five for care, so one, two, three, four, five, and one to five for challenge, and just see where you land. So obviously cultures are dynamic and they move around and it always feels different depending on the meeting and depending on the stakeholders and depending on the thing that, that you're dealing with. But I would suggest that there's usually default patterns in most cultures and the way to find out what your default patterns are is reflect on how your team shows up under pressure. Reflect on how your team shows up under stress in the context of that and it'll give you some clues as to where your culture is really at. So take this away to reflect and just get a sense. Don't overthink this. This is a, is a feeling based thing. So take this away to reflect on where you think your culture is. But also use it as a way to have a conversation with your team. It's interesting to compare notes on this stuff. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a business 
and the leader will say our accountability is sort of down here and the staff will say no no accountability is a real strength so it's interesting hearing those different perspectives and that comes from not having a common language or a common way to assess where your culture's at so use this not only for your self-reflection but also for, as a way to have a chat with your team. I'm going to finish quickly with a quote, an another one from the sporting world. Uh, Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest basketball players that ever lived, uh, he, he was tragically taken from us in a helicopter accident in 2020, um, but he's left us with a couple of real gems. Thanks, guys. I'll hand it over to Tani. Good morning, everyone. So Emily's walked us through why hiring the right people is so critical to a culture of accountability. And then equally, why that culture of accountability will drive performance outcomes. Ivan's given us a really good framework around challenge and care. And a lot of what I'm going to walk through in terms of some practical solutions is going to fit really nicely into Ivan's framework. Ivan also mentioned Craig Bellamy. Didn't have a great weekend, <laughs> Ivan go the doggies. But anybody who watched that game, I'm assuming that not too many of you did because, you know, we're sitting at the bottom of the table. You might have seen at half time, Craig Bellamy held those boys accountable. It was brutal. And we won't talk about the aggressive side of this, but I think professional sport is a very interesting context to talk about accountability because the spotlight is on every aspect of what they do, from their budgets through to their results are out there for the world to see. And whether we're talking about an NRL team, who then at the press conference, Craig Bellamy also took accountability. He didn't sit there and give excuses um, consistently. It was simply, we weren't good enough. And you just know the way that he delivered that message, we weren't good enough, it was we, he took responsibility, and you know those guys are going to have a rough week in the training paddock. Whether it's NRL or F1, if there are any F1 fans in the room, seeing Toto Wolf demolish the, the pit when he's not happy, you know that there is really high accountability there. Imagine if you had that spotlight in your organisations on everything you do. Would you show up a little differently? Would your team show up a little differently? I think the workplace, from our perspective as HR consultants, it's not under the spotlight so much, but some of the frameworks that you can put in place can bring that level of transparency. We're not suggesting put everybody on blast, but bringing a level of transparency to how you do things, why you do things, can really help drive that, that accountability. Um, so, sorry, first of all, stand up, please. You've been sitting down, get your... Okay, I'm going to assume that most people in the room today are leaders. So please take these questions as a reflection of your team. If you don't have a team, then think about yourself and, and answer them from your own perspective. So please sit down if you do, have, if you do not have KPIs or goals or success measures. Please sit down if you, if you did not have a say in forming those KPIs. They were given to you. Here's your goals. Oh, we've got some good organisations in the room. Of course they are. Please sit down if your team know what your KPIs, if your team do not know what your KPIs are. Please stay standing if you've had a conversation with your team about their KPIs in the last two months. So everyone's chatted to their teams about their KPIs in the last couple of months. Beautiful. Please stay standing. If, you're, if you are really confident that your team could articulate how their KPIs contribute to your organisation's vision. <laughs> Is that because you're wearing heels or? <laughs> Excellent. So I think we've got, you know, maybe half the room, maybe 40% of the room. Thank you so much. You can all take a seat again. So my point being there that I, yeah, were my team still standing there? I don't, I didn't pay attention. I need to take a look at that. That's some feedback for you. Um, my point being there 
that there are lots of uh, there are lots of um, there's lots of depth to success measures. It's not as simple as putting some KPIs on a on a piece of paper. And I use that term KPIs because it's kind of common language. But I know that I don't know if we've got any tech teams in the room today. You feel a little bit. Um, you have a, have a response that's a trigger word there, KPIs. But how, whatever we call them, goals, success measures, there's a lot of depth that we need to talk to. Ivan um, gave you a framework around care and challenge. So I've got a, a little bit of a take on some of the individuals that sit in that framework. So most of you would have heard of the concept of talented jerks sales. <laughs> the, they're the people in your teams who they are crushing it. They're the ones who describe, usually describe themselves as weapons and guns and you know, they're the, the ones who get the, I'm seeing some laughs because I know you know these people. Seeing some, um, sorry, they're the ones who get the results, nail their KPIs, add value to the organisation, usually on the bottom line but their behaviour is sometimes less than optimal. And we're not typically holding them accountable because, as Ivan spoke to, we're trading on those eggshells because we don't want to lose that revenue. You know, we don't want to lose that person who our clients love. We don't want to lose that expertise and skill in our business because, you know, that's just Bob. Sorry, Bob. The lovely underperformer. This is, the, I'm sorry, Ivan and I have known each other for quite a long time, so I feel like I can call him out here. This is Ivan with his son. I'm guessing it was a mullet of some sort that he came home with. That lovely underperformer. They're so nice. Any office fans? American office? Jim from the office. You get through the office and he's so nice, he's so sweet. You want, you know, everyone wants a Jim as a colleague. But then you realise he's a bully. He sexually harassed his colleague and he's actually not that good at his job. <laughs> but did anybody ever call him out on that? No, because he's so lovely. Then we've got the confident bullshitter. So these are, these are the ones that are a little bit harder to diagnose and they kind of speak to Emily's um, accidental um, diminisher. Thank you, the accidental diminisher. They're the ones that will walk into the performance review and say, yep, I have really grown this year. And they'll, use, they'll be very careful. They'll, they'll use words like, I've grown, I've really learned, I've evolved this, I've developed these relationships. But what have you actually done? Oh, no, no, we don't have the reports, the systems aren't working, the, we, we just don't have that data. When you dive a little deeper, there's not much substance, but they can get across the line because they're those, you know, cruising in neutral kind of people, I think. And then the emperor's new clothes. And again, this speaks, speaks to Ivan's framework. This is the one where everyone's sitting in the room and nodding, but in my, I, I'm a little bit more dramatic than Ivan, if you couldn't tell, and so I take this a little, uh, one step further, they're often the people pleasers who'll tell leaders what you want to hear, but walk away and not take any action. There's no bias for action there. Certainly they can be underminers from a culture perspective, but when we're talking about performance, they aren't willing to do anything. They'll just sit there and nod and tell you, yes, that's a great idea. I mean, um, Theranos, I'm sure people weren't walking in and telling Lizzie Holmes that our product sucks they wouldn't have gotten into the position that, they're, that they were in if they had that culture of transparency and accountability. So how do we use our superpowers? As leaders, I think these things, when we put them up on a slide, they seem, oh yes, very, that's, I've seen that before, I've done that before. But then to actually activate these tools in the workplace on a consistent basis, to go on the roadshow and have the guts to have those conversations, and more importantly, put the structures in place to have the conversations, it takes a bit of courage. And we talk about these things in a way that is scalable. So relying on one charismatic leader that Emily was speaking to is not enough. 
to multiply that through your actions is certainly a, a something that we're seeking, but also the structure in your business and the frameworks in your business, you know, you're looking to um, 101 this. You want to be HR for dummies, right? Accountability for dummies. Let's put some tools in place to help our leaders focus on their jobs, get back to business, but also build that expectation of accountability. So we start very simply with clarity. And I know that sounds quite simple, but half of you sat down when, when I asked the question, can your team connect what they do or their goals to the vision of the organisation? That's clarity. Having clarity on where am I going to be in my nine to five, that's a good starting point. But having clarity in what am I actually responsible for is a whole new level. And we'll talk a little more about this. The second piece is structure. So this is around your workflows and your frameworks in your business. So, I mean, 10 years ago, Deloitte was telling us the performance review is dead. There are no more re performance reviews. Anybody who knows anybody who's worked for Deloitte knows that is not true. They just rebranded it, right? Like quiet quitting. This is not a new phenomenon. Someone just decided this is the new lingo that we're using now. So things like your performance reviews, insert here, whatever cool name you want to give it, um, incredibly important. And again, we'll talk to this in a second. And then the human skills piece. So having the structures in place, having the clarity, only gets you so far as the capacity and capability of your leaders. If it can't be communicated, if it's not communicated in an appropriate and um, charismatic and inspiring way, then you're, only go you're going to be limited. So we're going to focus on the clarity and the structure today because the human skills, frankly, is a whole other topic and, and um, too much to cover adequately in one day. So the plays. We want to start with the big picture and zoom in. So this means starting with your vision or starting with your strategy. If your company doesn't have a vision or doesn't have a strategy that your frontline team can articulate, can tell somebody over the phone, can tell their mates when they're having a beer on Friday, then it's not good enough. It's time to go and talk to that guy. Need to be able to get your strategy clear and articulate so every person in your organisation knows exactly what it means. Then you agree on the pillars. How are we measuring success? What's important to us? And this often um, is realised in your strategic plan or your operational plan. It's how we're bringing that vision to life. Because having a vision, we're going to be the masters of the universe, that's not good enough for the person who's on the phones every day doing phone screens as a recruiter. Not future you, of course. That vision needs to be translated into meaningful, actionable pillars that the team can understand. Here's where I fit. We're all just trying to belong in a workplace more than, more than many other contexts. We need to agree on a consistent structure for success measures. So call these your KPIs, your goals, your OKRs, any other acronym that I can make up. These are the things that you're measuring and monitoring. Um, a very simple, very simple structure here is one for me, one for the team, one for the company. To sit down and have a growth conversation with your team and uh, with one of your team members and they sort of say, I want to develop my confidence and my um, public speaking skills and oh, I want to do an Excel course and their job is in marketing, that's not really going to hit the, hit the vision necessarily. So people understanding that their expectation of accountability of their performance isn't only self-growth and self-development, despite what TikTok might tell them, they do need to align it back to the company, um, really is very important. And then test and evolve. So how do the, do the success measures support the team's goals and the company's goals? And what are the gaps? If I asked any one of you, what were you doing on, what's the date today? The 16th of March, 2022, last year. I mean, I, couldn't, I can't even remember if I turned off my hair straightener this morning. So to have an annual review process where you're expecting people to kind of save up all of their memorable moments or moments that matter, you're only going to get the highlights real. 
you may as well go to their social media and see what was, what was their highlights reel for the year. They'll talk to you about the high highs and the low lows. But what's really important is that 80% of the time that's spent in the grit zone, the zone where you need discipline and structure and that day-to-day -day delivery of your role to, to contribute to the company's mission. And if there's a strategic goal that no one's accountable for, then how will it ever be achieved? So thinking big picture here, if you've mapped out your entire team's goals or success measures and mapped them against your company's goals, makes your conversations with your leaders and your board very simple because you can hold people accountable, you can hold teams accountable. And then, to Ivan's point, you can reward and recognise accordingly. So just stepping this out, Again, because this is, our, this is our practical takeaway, I suppose. Start with the big picture. Do you have a vision? Go back, to your, go back to your office and ask someone in your team, do you know what our vision is or our strategy is this year? And do you know what role you play in that? If they start struggling to answer, then that's your, that's your feedback, that's your response. Your pillars of accountability, what are the areas that we're going to focus on? What's important to us this year? Your success measures, if, you've, if your team have 10 KPIs, do better. This needs to be simple. They, I'm not suggesting you need to put it on their desktops or you know, put it on the wall, but they need to be really clear on what it is that they are out to achieve and then test and evolve. If you haven't looked at your frameworks for probably more than 12 months or since COVID, since pandemic, it's time to revisit. It's time to think, are we progressive? Are we moving? forward on what we're offering our employees for their experience in our company or are we just doing things the same way we've always done them? And then just to wrap up, I think the Ivan's point about walking on eggshells, it really highlights the fear that is instilled in leaders. Um, some com very simple conversations post-pandemic have been around how do I ask people to come back into the office? How do I... I'm, I'm terrified of resignations. They're symptoms of more than just a lack of accountability. They're symptoms of a broader uh, people framework that you're not confident in, that you don't have trust in. And it starts with your vision, and it permeates down through your culture. So as a leader, my final words to you are, if there's any fear around conversations that you're having with your team or with individuals in your team, then it's time to start asking some questions because that accountability starts with us as number one and holding ourselves accountable to what am I scared of? And then how do I find the solutions to these questions? I just want to wrap up Echo Ivan's thanks to Emily and Tanya and the Future You team. This is a beautiful view, it's a beautiful morning and we're really grateful to all of you for getting up early and coming to have breakfast with us. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, any questions or comments or...? Yeah, thank you. One of the things that was mentioned here is that it's not really about the KPIs and the SLAs and OKRs and all of this stuff. It's more about people feeling accountable. So the question is, how do you, how do you invoke that feeling in people? Um, I, w I think it's down to um, creating a culture where you all have the, the same values so that you can speak up and talk about how you are thinking of feeling and leaders leading people as people. So understanding what does actually motivate them, what is gonna get them to come in and perform at their best. So like I, I sort of mentioned, the, the qualifications and the experience is sort of a given, but it's understanding people as people, what's going on in their personal life, why are they inspired by that, by that leader or not, to create the feeling of not wanting to let the team down um, to hit their targets, I would say. Echo, echo that. Um, shared values, connecting vision to, to people's KPIs so they can clearly see how they're contributing 
and making sure that this is another Bellamy thing, making sure that it's clearly understood how you're letting your teammates down when you're not doing your thing. Um, and that I think that's important. So that creates that sort of feeling of um, what I do matters and what I do helps and what I, also, when I, what I don't do hurts um, if, if I don't do my piece. Hire good people. I think it starts, I'll echo these guys, it starts with good values, good human values, but it's a lot to ask for people to feel accountable. Um, that's, a, that's a big ask, that's a high aspiration. Uh, and our, my advice from a HR perspective is start with your structures because they're accessible. They're, they're not um, asking too much of your team if you're coming off a base of you need improvement. And then as you evolve and as you develop the confidence working in those structures, that trust will build and therefore that care factor will build. Um, we can't train people how to feel, but we definitely, definitely can continue to engage them to continue to care. Uh, and I think as workplaces and leaders, if we, if we aspire to that, that's a really good starting point. Um, thank you to the speakers. That was a really interesting topic. Um, I think as leaders, we are accountable for developing um, a culture of, and Simon Senior talks about psychological safety. So for people to feel accountable, if we empower them as, you, as, as leaders, for me it's about, you know, I use the expression, learn to fail and fail to learn. But again, there needs to be a safe environment in which people do that. So unless we're creating a culture where people feel okay to be accountable if it doesn't work, um, we're not creating that kind of positive, empowering culture. So I think there's, there's that trust is a super important element of all of this. So for me, the accountability goes both ways. Yeah, so it's more a comment than a question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Joe. Any other questions? Uh, uh, can you, can you, should I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want me to pass it? Thank you, Joe, yeah, thank you. Hi, um, thanks for today. My question is more about those above you. So a lot of us leaders here would have teams underneath us, anywhere from a few people, maybe to 100. But a lot of us leaders also have people above us. And I find that over the last few years, enterprises that I've worked at, middle management tend to leave because they're doing a great job of their staff underneath but they're not making their CEO or board or one or two people above them accountable. So how does that work in reverse or is that a completely different topic if us leaders are doing a great job but we're not getting the support that we need? Yeah, great point. Um, I think it goes down to the fact that you can coach up and you can hold leaders above to be accountable as well by using all of these things in terms of what their vision is, are they achieving it, speaking up. But it's, it's, it's obviously much, much harder because people are fearful of the fact that if they speak up too much, will their job be safe? Um, but you can definitely coach up. And I think that comes down to the fact that, you know, often when people leave, they leave leaders. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, there is more development in place now for CEOs and exec leadership teams to actually develop to be a multiplier, um, you know, rather than a, than a poor leader. See something, say something. So that, that's the motto of the storm. I'm leaning on him heavily today, aren't I? Um, and that's a 360. It's not top down. It's everything. It's bottom up, left, right, right, left. Um, so there's a demand in that culture that people say something no matter the orient or the relationship, whether it's up or, 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 or down. So translating that to the business, I can only sort of echo the, the presentations today just to have those um, radically honest conversations with care and respect, but also challenging your leaders. And um, if that works, great. If it doesn't, you're just going to make a hard decision. Otherwise, you'll just continue to, to, to enable it. Yeah, quit your job. <laughs> Any other questions or comments, please? 
Thank you. Um, I guess building on the last two questions, um, I think over COVID, one of the things that has eroded a bit is that ability to build trust and relationships because people have been working remotely. You know, they've gone into themselves a bit more as opposed to really forming teams. And I think I've seen that with executives in particular that they've sort of, I mean, they've sort of stayed bonded but haven't really been visible to employees as much as what they would have been in the past. What would be your advice about um, for trying to build that, um, that ability for executives to demonstrate accountability and to start to rebuild um, their relationships with the organisation um, coming off the back of COVID? Thank you. Um, I think coming in and having those connection <coughs> days um, where everyone is in the space together but using that time for collaboration, driving culture, revisiting the vision, how are we tracking against that? So, you know, not just all cult cultural niceties, but actually relaying how the business is tracking against the strategic plan, um, having to bring people together. Because we've all talked in the past about when people are working from home, it's just task, job, task, job, but it's not linked back to the, um, the purpose and building relationships. So I think having to come in and have those connectivity days works. I think it's a mindset thing. I work with global companies that um, can never come together physically and they made it work. So I think it's just crept in. If I'm being brutally honest, I think it's become a bit of an excuse, uh, the remote working in COVID, and I think it's a mindset thing. Um, this has been working. Global businesses have been around forever. And so um, just finding a rhythm with your team, whether it be in person or not, um, COVID's just an excuse. Yeah, agree with Ivan. I think it comes down to communication and reframing how we do. It's the same principles. It's a different vehicle for delivery. It's still communication. It's still care. It's still engagement of your team. And it's still creating a good experience for that team, um, all leading to that culture of accountability. But the vehicle is very different. And so understanding technology and understanding distributed teams uh, requires a lot of consultation with the team to, to find out what it is that they want to see and hear and how. Um, and also just frankly so getting out there and doing some um, research, getting exposure to how distributed teams who are doing this well um, are, are doing it. I mean we all know Atlassian's been in the news lately but they do it so well. Don Price is, puts everything out there on LinkedIn. It's like his own personal diary in the most positive way. Um, for how they make, how they drive culture in a, in a distributed team. Any other questions or comments? No? Excellent. Okay, well, thank you all so much again for coming this morning. Thank you to everyone who's helped organise today. Um, as we mentioned, the barista's still there, the food's still there, we're still here. So please feel free to take the chance to chat amongst yourselves and, yeah, connect. Thank you all so much. Thank you.